do. They are controversial, but they have not been really redone before. These are so new. Some of the material that we introduced on Wednesday uh, were only a few weeks old. And that's why we want to get this out in the public sphere. And that's why we chose Hong Kong as a place, as a, uh, as a springboard to get this not only so you can hear it, but also we're filming it so it'll immediately go up onto YouTube. Because we want Muslims all over the world to hear this new material. More than that, we want to make sure that we do debate this material. Because it's so new, that's why the Muslims did not want to debate it. And uh, even in uh, England, uh, I know that many of the Muslims who are probably watching this from England, uh, they have been sending emails to the Muslims here in Hong Kong on how to try to, sh to confront these uh, ideas, especially the material that I'm going to introduce today. What we did on Wednesday is probably, I feel, the Achilles heel of Islam. We really did confront the Quran historically. And this is what every religion has to do. Every religion requires, if it makes a religious claim, as both Islam and Christianity do, so, does the, so do the Sikhs, so do the Buddhists, so do the Hindus, uh, even do, so do the humanists and the atheists, they, we all make historical claims. When you make a historical claim, you have to investigate it. You have to name, look at names, dates, places, and events. Those are the four historical areas that you have to investigate. So far, the Bible has only been investigated in those four areas. We have had almost 100 to 150 years of investigation on the Bible itself. Redacted criticism, source criticism, historical criticism, literary criticism, the documentary hypothesis. These are well-known criticisms that have been around since the 1800s. The Quran, for the first time, is going under that kind of scrutiny. That was the material that we introduced on Wednesday night. And the Muslims did not want to debate it. Very few Muslims showed up. That's okay. This is going up now so that thousands and millions of Muslims can now see it. But what we're saying to Muslims is don't stop there. Listen to these criticisms. Take them on board. Go back and ask and try to find out if you can find any answers to these criticisms like we have as Christians. We have found answers to everything about our Bible. We have been able now, we pretty well know the source criticism. We know how to answer the redacted criticism. We, the documentary hypothesis is not even being taught because we have responded to every one of those criticisms because the, when the Bible does talk about history, when it talks about a certain person doing a certain thing at a certain place at a certain time, in every case the Bible has been proven to be correct. So much so that today there is not one artifact, there is not one mural, there is not one stella, there is not one obelisk, there is not one tablet anywhere in the world that we can find that controverts a properly understood biblical statement. Let me repeat that. Today, there is not one piece of historical artifact anywhere in the world that controverts a properly understood biblical statement. And the Bible is the only book of history that can make that claim. So now we're taming the tables and we're now asking the same of Islam. And that's my area of expertise. I'm an Islamicist. Some of the material that we're introducing tonight comes out of my doctoral thesis, but much of it I have nothing to do with. Most everything I'm going to introduce tonight, I have nothing to do with. And what you're going to see tonight, this is not a Christian polemic. This is not a Christian attack against Islam. This is a historical polemic. That's what we call it, a historical critique. This is the same critique that must be done on the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the Granth Sahib, you name it, any religious text or any religious edifice should have this critique pretty down to it. Christianity is way ahead of the rest of the world. That's why it's so, it makes my job so much easier. I did have this kind of material 35 years ago when I started working in the Islamic world. I didn't have what I'm going to show you today, nor what I we showed you on Wednesday night. Now, this never was available to me when I started this whole endeavor of working in Islam. That's why we want to make sure that this is not only offered to you here in Hong Kong, that everyone, and I'm talking to the people who are watching this, all of you can now use this material and Muslims engage with it. So have more, many debates on it. Maybe this will be the beginning of many new enterprises, but what we're really hoping is that Muslims take on board the implications of what we're doing today. And I will talk about those implications as we move on. So let's go ahead.
And let's get into this talk today. What do Muslims claim about themselves? Well, they would say that Muhammad is the last and greatest prophet. I don't think any Muslim would decry that. They would assume whether they are conservative, nominal, liberal, they would all agree that Muhammad is the last prophet, the greatest prophet, the seal of all the prophets. They would say the Quran was his revelation, sent down only to him, and is the finest and greatest revelation that he received it over a period of 23 years from 610 to 622, and that that then was compiled completely at the time of Uthman, uh, about 20, roughly 20 years after he died, and that it's never changed. And that Islam as a, a religion is the final religion based on Muhammad's life and sayings, the Sunnah, and on the Quran's teaching. So it's based on the Book of the Man, the Book of the Man, the Book of the Man. I've said this many times this week. That's their claims. The conclusion is, Islam is completely dependent, therefore, on one book modeled by one man. And we as Christians would say much the same thing. We are also modeled on a bigger book modeled by a bigger man, the Bible in Jesus Christ. Therefore, since it's modeled by one book and one man, we need to investigate that man and we need to investigate that book and see indeed if Muslims are correct. Now, what is the classical account concerning Muhammad? What we have known about Muhammad is that he was born in 570 AD. No one has ever disputed that. And this is the classical account. This is the account you're going to hear in every school. It has been everywhere you go. This is what I have been taught. And for 35 years, I've always assumed this is correct. Born in 570 to a mother named Amina. His father had already died, Abdullah. And so there he was born to a widow. In 610, he was up in the Hidal cave, and he suddenly a a a. a, a, a an individual, he didn't know who it was at the time, appeared to him and said, Akka, that means recite. And his response was, Ma'aka, I cannot recite. That happened in 610, and they hit a cave. He came back and told his wife what had happened. She gave him three different tests to see if he was telling the truth. And after he passed all three of those tests, she then gave, took him to her her cousin named Waraka ibn Nofa. He wanted to hear the story. He was a Nestorian Christian. Isn't that one of the ironies of history? And he said, truly, are you a prophet for what you have just referred to me? And that's why it was a Nestorian Christian who actually gave Muhammad his authority as a prophet. That happened in 610. From 610 to 622 then, we Muhammad started receiving what we know as the Meccan revelations, though, or the Meccan uh, surahs. These are the second half or the latter half of the Quran. In 621, he gets woken up in the middle of the night, and he's told to get on the back of a wing horse called the Burak, and he flies from uh, Mecca up to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem, he then up, goes up the seven heavens to meet with Allah, who tells him to pray 50 times a day, comes down to the fifth heaven, Muhammad uh, then bumps into Moses, and Moses says, ah, see if you can get it down. So he goes back and forth between the seventh and the fifth heaven, getting down the prayers from 50 to 45 to 40, 35, 20, 15, finally down to five prayers. Once he gets it to five prayers, Moses says, that's fine, go on back down to earth. So he comes back down to Jerusalem, where the Dome of the Rock is now built, and then he flies back down to Mecca in 621, known as the Miraj. Miraj, and that is the story that is accounted, that is referred to for, by Muslims today, and that is why they believe the Dome of the Rock was built to commemorate that event, 621. In 622, then he goes with about anywhere from 80 to 200 of his disciples. We don't know for sure because there are many different contradictions concerning the exact number. He goes with these disciples and he then goes and moves up to Medina. That's known as the Hijrah. The Hijrah means the Exodus. So he goes and takes this Exodus from Mecca to Medina. And then from 622 to 632, the last 10 years of his life, he receives the Medinan revelations. He's now living in Medina, that's why it's given its name, referring to the city he lived in. That's the first half of the Quran. That's the Medinan revelation. In 630, he then marches down, walks right into Mecca, and takes it over without firing a shot. He took it over peacefully. That happened in 630, and then in 632, he died. Possibly by poisoning, we don't know. 
At that time, the Quran had not been written down in a complete form. It had been memorized by many of the followers of Muhammad. Parts of it was written on stones and bones and pieces of bark, but it had not been written as a codified text. So this book that I have in my hand here is was not written down in this form in 632 when Muhammad died. And that we saw very clearly when we unpacked it on Wednesday night. Abu Bakr then takes over control as the first caliph from 622 to 634. During his reign, the, the Quran was first written down by Zaid ibn Thabit. That happens between 632 and 634. He dies peacefully and Umar takes over and he reigns from 634 to 644. The next 10 years, he is killed. And then Uthman takes over and from 644 to 656, for the next 12 years, much uh, the second Reception or this Quran supposedly was written down. This is known as the Uthmanic recension. We pretty well dispel that on Wednesday. This is not the Uthmanic recension. This is only 93 years old. This is the Al Azhar text, the Hafs text, as a well known, created just 93 years ago in 624. Then in 655 to 656, when Uthman was killed, and so Ali, the, uh, the uh, the adopted son of Muhammad then takes over from 656 to 660 in the last five years. Uh, he only lasts for five years, and then he is killed by Muawiyah and the Umayyad Caliphate. Now that is known as the classical account. That's what we all have been told. There, there may be some variations. I've left an awful lot out. I've just given you the bare skeleton of what we know as the classical account. Is it true? Can you prove that this is true? How would you want to prove that this is true? Maybe that's the better question. Well, I would suppose and I would hope that somebody was there to see these events. Someone actually knew Muhammad wrote about these events, wouldn't you? Yet everything I have just told you in the last 10 minutes, referring to all that you see up here on the screen, all of it, though it took place in this part, in this red area, none of it was written down in that time. None of this was written down during the time of Muhammad at all. None of it was written down in the same century as Muhammad. None of it was written down during this period, or this period, or this period. In order to find out everything I have just told you, in order to find out where these stories come from, you need to go to this period. And the first person to write down the story of Muhammad is Sira, his name is named Ibn Issa. Ibn Issa died in 765, right here. We don't have any of Ibn Issa's material. Does it exist today? There's nothing extant from Ibn Issa. We're only told about it by this man here, Ibn Isham. Ibn Isham dies in 833, so he dies in the 9th century. Everything we know about Muhammad, what he did, what he was doing in Medina, what he was doing in Mecca, all these stories that we've just talked about, the entire classical account about who Muhammad was and how Islam began, is first written down in the ninth century. Muhammad died in the sixth, I'm sorry, in the seventh century. Do you have a problem with that? You should all be saying in your head, yes, we all have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. What about Muhammad's sayings? Because that's even more prolific. If you want to go to Muhammad's sayings, you need to go to this man here. Al Buhari. He dies in 870. He's the first to write down what Muhammad said. He was given 600,000 of these sayings. He then whittled them down to and throw out 98% of them, only retained around 4, 7,400. That means only retained 2% of it, threw out the other 98%, and that's what we have today as the Sahih al Buhari. Sahih al Buhari, the most authoritative, it's called Sahih, that means it is perfect without error. But take a look when it was written down. It was written round way over here in the late 9th century. That's 240 years after Muhammad's death. If you want to get other hadith, like Sahih Muslim or Ibn Dawud or Ibn Tirmidhi, they all come after Al-Buhari. Al-Buhari is the first. If you want to talk about the tafsir, which would be the commentaries on this book, you need to go to al tabari And al tabari is right here. He died in 920. That's the 10th century. That's 300 years later. Now, there are many other tafsir that come after him, but not before him. He is the first to write down the commentaries and also the history, the tahrik 
all of these come begin with al -Dabri. You have Banawi, Zamashari, Suyuti, many who come after, but none of them come before al -Dabri. So basically, everything we're looking at here, everything that happens here, doesn't get written down until here. Roughly two to three hundred years later. Now, if you look at the Bible, we know when Jesus dies in 33 AD. When he dies in 33 AD, we almost have immediately Paul's letters, 50, within 15 years of Christ's death, Paul begins to write his letters. So he was writing in the same century, he was also writing the same time that Jesus lived, though he did never knew Jesus. But then we start getting the gospel accounts. We have Matthew, Mark, and Luke written within 20 to 30 years of Christ's death, at the latest 40 years of Christ's death. And then you have the Gospel of John written in the late uh, first century, uh, about 92 AD. So you have that within 60 years of Christ's death. Two of those four Gospel writers actually knew Jesus Christ. They actually saw Jesus Christ. They actually lived with Jesus Christ for three years. John and Matthew spent the last three years of his life with them. So these are eyewitness accounts. The other two got it from the eyewitnesses. And that's why we can trust them because of the fact that so much of what they wrote, they actually participated in. All of the New Testament, including his life and his sayings, were written within the first century, within 60 years of Christ's death. When you do a comparison, when you look at how Christianity began, and who began it, and about the life of Jesus himself, that's written within 15 to 60 years of Christ's death. When you look at Islam and Muhammad, and how he began, and how what he did, and how Islam began, that's written within two to three hundred years later, which is more authoritative. And that's why we're asking this question today. If we were dependent on knowing who Jesus is, using the same criteria that Islam is dependent on, we would know nothing about Jesus Christ till the third century. How could we defend him? How could we support him? How could we say we knew anything he did or anything he said? None of us could. And yet Muslims have not talked about this. This is the elephant in the room that Muslims don't want to talk about. Everything they know about Muhammad comes from two to three hundred years later. Now, 21st century scholars legitimately and rightly so are concerned about this. And they're saying Islam as we know it did not exist in the 7th century but evolved over a period of two to three hundred years. The Quran probably was not revealed to one man in 22 years but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. Their conclusion, the history of Islam at least from the time of the Caliph of the Malik, that's very important, his name's going to come up again today and before is a later fabrication. You can see now why they're saying this. As historians, there is a real problem that they're having. Here are the problems. If so much of the history of early Islam was written down so late, then why did it take so long to write it down? Well, Muslims have always come back to me and said, well, they're not literate. That's why I didn't write it down. Well, no, they claim Muhammad was not literate, but you cannot tell me that the Muslims did not know how to read and write. We know that by 661, they had controlled all of North Africa, going over the west and all the way over to India. And they, by 652, they controlled Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo. Are you saying no one could write in Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo in the seventh century? What are you gonna do with the beautiful library that was in Alexandria that was burned to the ground in the fifth century? What about Zayd ibn Thabit, the secretary of Muhammad? He was a secretary. What do secretaries do? They write. Otherwise, what's their purpose? So you cannot tell me people could not read or write then. Maybe Muhammad did read or write, but everybody around him read and wrote. Where did the ninth century biographers, therefore, get their material from? If they were not living at that time, if they were living hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years later, how did they know what really happened? And what and where did the material come from? Now, Muslims will tell you that they come from what they call Isnad. So before every Akbar, there's a list of names. So-and-so who got from so-and-so who got from so-and-so who got from the Prophet himself. The problem with every one of those so-and-so is they never wrote down anything that they said or that they sent out. So therefore, we have no idea whether or not any of the names which are attributed to those, to those saints are true. And basically what we're looking at 
is a religion based on oral tradition. Now, I don't trust oral tradition. If I tell this gentleman something, he tells him, he tells him, he tells him. By the time he gets over to this woman over here, what I told him and what she tells me are probably two different things. We play Chinese whispers, sorry, if that's, I hope that's not offensive, but that's what we do at birthday parties and or telephone. It's a very fun game to play. And within a fifth man, matter of 15 minutes, the story gets changed. Can you imagine if that story goes for 200 years, how it would get changed? and how it would get embellished. Can you see the difficulty? That's the problem of oral tradition. If nothing is written down, then how do we know what, whether any of the so-and-sos, what they said is correct? Therefore, since we have to wait two to 300 years, should we go to the period these events took place? Let's go back to the seventh century and see what we find. And this is what they're finding. That's what we're going to unpack today. Now let's take a look at the map so you know what we're talking about. This is a part of the world that, about 661, this is a part of the world that they controlled. They quickly went then off right across North Africa, destroyed the church as they went, and they went and took over Andalusia, which is today Spain. The other way, they were moving this direction over here towards the Persian world, all the way into what then became the Mongol Empire, and of course India, uh, and Pakistan, and then further afield, Bangladesh today. So that whole swath of land soon became under their control by the late 7th century. Now, the people that I'm going to be using for this material, this is not my material. Let me repeat that again. This is not my material. I am nothing more than a messenger. I am nothing more than the one who communicates it to you. I, would, I am not capable of this doing this kind of research. You will see why. But the ones who have done this research, People like Dr. John Wansberg, he was the one was the first one that taught me this material. He was head of department at School of Oriental and African Study in the University of London when I started taking this course, these courses in 2004. I'm sorry, 1994. Let's get my dates right. Why I'm much older than I realize. 1994. <laughs> my goodness, I feel old. That, that's uh, 23 years ago that I started. For 23 years, I've been working this with this material, and he was the one that first opened me up to it. And he was the one that was amazing because he was taking what everybody else was saying and was putting it into layman's terminology. That's not, I got the wrong person, that's the next man haunting. Dr. Wandsborough is the one that was in charge and responsible there at School of Warrington African Studies. He's the one that wrote two books called Quranic Studies and Sectarian Milieu. These two books in 1977 and 1978 basically blew open this whole problem. And he was the first one to actually look at the Quran literalistically and say, we've got a real problem. This book has a lot of stories that would not have made any sense that early. These could only have been written at a much later date. Dr. Gerald Haunting is the one that taught me. Gerald Haunting, I credit with much of the material that I have today was because he got me interested in it. And that's why I've been working with this material for almost 25 years. Dr. Patricia Kroner, I got to know her. She was my supervisor when I began my doctorate back in the 1990s my first doctorate, and she said that she was working there in uh, Oxford University to begin with, and then she wrote a book in 1975 called Haterism. She got death threats for that book, and so she moved from Oxford over to Cambridge, and that's where I got to know her. And when I did my first debate on this material in 1995, that's 22 years ago I did my first debate on this material. In 1995, I went up to her, and she was the one that, yes, said, helped me put that debate together. Dr. Patricia Crone reads and writes 15 languages, all archaic languages. These are not modern languages. These are, many of them are unknown today. She is one of the few in the world that can read and write in all 15 languages. She is from Denmark. She has just died, she died a year ago. But there's nobody that can equal her anywhere in the world. And that's why she's so dangerous, because she goes back to the original texts. She goes back to the original writing. She's a linguist. Dr. Andrew Rippin, uh, from Calgary, he just died a few months ago. He was also a good man. What he did is he took all this very academic material and brought it into layman's terminology. So when you read his material, it's much easier to read. Out of Calgary in Canada. Dr. Robert Hoyden, out of Oxford University. He reads and writes 18 languages. I got to know him when he was at Cambridge University, and it was amazing to see what he could do and what he could find. And he was the one that probably took all the surrounding material that was happening in the 7th and 8th century and put it into a book called Islam for as others see it. Dr. Yehuda Neville out of Jerusalem, 
crossroads to Islam was the one that actually went back to the earliest inscriptions and actually translated their inscriptions so we could read them today, showing what kind of what kind of documentation material we have in the seventh and eighth century. And then from Germany, we have Dr. Gunther Lulling, Dr. Gerd Quinn, Dr. von Volkmer, and Dr. Oleg. These four major scholars, these are part, probably the most authoritative scholars when it comes to the Arabic material and also the Syriac material. That's why they've been so valuable. But these have not been better. You're getting the best scholars in the world here who have been working on this material. So I'm offering you the best. Every one of these men are at the top of their field and women. But then there have been two books that have come out to try to unpack these, this all their writing, because these are academics. And you, as you well know, academics are hopeless communicators. They have a lot, a lot up here, but they're not, they're not good at communicating what they have. They're boring as ever to listen to, and they don't even understand to how to popularize it so the rest of us can understand it. Dr. Patricia Corona is well known for writing essay after essay where she writes and she keeps them in, she keeps her quotations in the original language, which none of us can understand. So you need people like Dr. Tom Holland. Dr. Tom Holland is a literary major from Cambridge University, and he was the first one to take this material and popularize it in a book called In the Shadow of the Sword. If you have a chance, go get the book. It was published in 2012 taking much of this very difficult academic material and putting it into language terminology. He then put together a documentary called Islam, The Untold Story. It was shown on Channel 4 News, uh, Channel 4 Television uh, in Britain on August 28, 2012 at 9 p.m. Taking everything in, uh, he could in that book and putting it into a 90-minute documentary. Now, of course, he, did, he had to go very quick and very shallow into much of and came to no conclusions. Purposely did not want to come to any conclusions. Yet because of that filming, when they wanted to redo that filming, when they wanted to show it a second time in November of the same year, there's so many Muslims protested against that movie that they've never shown it a second time. That's how damaging that documentary is. You cannot watch that documentary here in Hong Kong. But I've got it on my computer. If any of you want it, just ask me, I'll give it to you. You can watch it tonight. You need to watch the video, you need to look at the documentary, because this is the material I think is the most damaging for Islam, historically. But then there's been some other material that's come out by this man here, Dr. Uh, Dan Gibson is an archeologist archeologist. You might say he is an Indiana Jones of today. His father was an archeologist, his grandfather was an archeologist. He spent 25 years living in the Middle East, living amongst the Bedouin, learning the languages, went to as many places as he could find in this book, in the Quran. He wanted to find it and physically go there. And so he spent from 1979 to 2004 learning to let to walk where he thought Muhammad had walked. The only problem is, and you'll see later, he found an awful lot of difficulty. But we're gonna introduce two of his books, one called uh, two books and one documentary, one called Ge Quranic Geography, which came out in 2011. A documentary called The Sacred City came out in May 2016, and then this book. This book has just come out. If you get a chance, get it. Early Islamic Kibbalists just came out in May of this year. This is probably the most damaging book right here. This is a culmination of 25 years of research. It's only been out for four months, and we're gonna be introducing some of his findings from that book tonight. And what he asks is, really, did Islam actually begin as Muslims have told us? Is there a city of Mecca? Was that the original holy city? Did the Qibla originally face Mecca? And what about all the geographical incongruities in the Quran itself? Now, I'm going to give you their conclusions before I even show you how they came to them. So let's start with their conclusions. These are the conclusions these scholars have found. First of all, they say that the first Arab inscription referencing Muhammad is, does not exist until 691. We know nothing about Muhammad's name from any Muslim sources. Ooh, did I say Muslim? From any Arab sources. There is no reference to Muhammad in any Arab sources prior to, 19, to 691. The first reference to people called Muslims is not till the 690s. Remember, Muhammad died in 632. That means 60 years after Muhammad death, death died, there is no Arab sources, literary, inscription, on buildings that refers to his name. 
The first reference to religion called Islam is not till 691, and it is first introduced on the Dome of the Rock there in Jerusalem. The first reference to Mecca, the city of Mecca, is not till 741. Think that through. Muhammad died there supposedly, or uh, in Medina, had been living in Mecca, died in Medina in 632. There is no reference to that city anywhere in the century that he lived. And the first biography of Muhammad, as you've already heard, within Islamic sources is not till 833. So what did these people call themselves if they didn't call themselves Muslims? From all the sources we can find, there were Arabs there. They did exist. They were conquering these cities. But they never called themselves Muslims. They called themselves Salasans. They called themselves Hagarins because they're in the line of Hagar. They called themselves Ishmaelites because they're in the line of Ishmael. They called themselves Maghreb because they're from the Maghreb. And they called themselves Mahajurun. That means people of the Hijra, people of the Exodus. They were nomadic. They were moving from one place to another. That's why they used those terms. But nowhere in any of their documentation do we find them referring to themselves as Muslims. So let's go to the first problem. And the first problem is geography itself. When you read the Quran, there are 65 geographical names or ge geographical places that re are referred to in this book. But we find over and over again, nine places are named, nine different places are named. We know of 23 references to the people from Ad, which is the biblical ooze. We have 24 references to the people from Tamud, which is the other name for the Nabataeans. They cut dwellings into mountains, things like that. We have seven references to the people from Midian. So therefore, these people from Ad, Tamud, and Midian must be pretty important if they're having this much contact with this prophet. But there's no reference in any of this right to a place called Mecca. Yet take a look and see where Ad, Tamud, and Midian are. The people from Ad, Tamud, and Midian are way up here. Mecca's way down here. There's 600 miles between these two. Unless this prophet, you notice I'm saying this prophet, because in the Quran, you will only find Muhammad's name four times. In the Arabic, oh, in the English, he's been added there every time. Every time it says the prophet, or the representative of God, or the, the Nabi, Nabi of Allah, it's always in parentheses, Muhammad. That's the reference, that's the inference. That's later Muslims have put that name in. But not in the Arabic. He's not there in the Arabic except four times. How many times is Jesus named in the, in the Quran? 93 times. Which supposes that Jesus is more important than Muhammad, even in the Quran, if you want to go by number of times that he's referred to. Now, when you look at the 65 references, geographical references, we find that almost in every case, the nine names are placed every time they, are, they do not fit Mecca. 600 miles too far north. Let's take a look at the Gospel of Luke, probably the most historical reference because that Luke was a doctor, medical doctor, and that's why he, re he refilled his pages with names of dates, places, events. When you look at the 110 geographical references in the Gospel of Luke, you will find he talks about 31 places named outright. In every case, all of them were correct. The right place, the right time, in the right area. Now, Let's go to Mecca, and this is where you can really see the problem. How many times is Mecca referred to in this book? Once. Surah 48, Ayah 24. That's it. If it's such an important city, why is there only one reference to it? We do know that quite a bit about Mecca. We know that if you look at the traditions and if you look at the Quran, when you look at the traditions, you will see that Mecca yeah, was the first sanctuary appointed. It doesn't say Mecca. It just says this is the first sanctuary appointed to mankind was that at Bukka, Surah 3, Ayah 96. It assumes that the place of the prophet is the mother of all settlements, and that it is where Adam and Eve were thrown down to. It is where Mecca, uh, it is where Abraham lived in 1900 BC, according to Surah 21, but it doesn't say the word Mecca. It just says this place of the prophet. So therefore, it's a pretty important place, though it never gives it a name. It just says the place of the prophet. In Surah 7, Ayah 24, Adam and Eve are thrown down to earth. According to the later tradition from the 9th and 10th century, they refer to that as Mecca, but not in the Quran. Abraham supposedly lived there because that's where the Kaaba is, but it doesn't call it to the name, and that's we know in Surah 21. I had no idea Abraham lived that far south. I thought Abraham way, lived way up in Canaan and Mesopotamia. 
It's where Muhammad was supposedly born, and lived until 622, but it doesn't give it a name. And Mecca is, uh, became the center of the Qibla in 624, but it doesn't say Mecca, even in Surah 2, Ayah 145 to 149. The only reference we have in Surah 48, Ayah 24, why is it only referred to once if it is so important? If it is the earliest settlement in the history of mankind, if it is where Abraham went to to rebuild the Kaaba, if it was a center of trade north, south, east, or west, if it is where Muhammad himself supposedly was born and grew up, then why don't they name the name? When you look at the traditions, you notice that this place where the prophet is from, that it's in a valley and has a parallel valley that has a stream going through it, it has a pillar of salt, it has fields, it has trees, it has grass, it has fruit, it has loam, it has olive trees, and it has a mountain overlooking the Kaaba. None of these things fit Mecca. Mecca is not in a valley. It is not, has, does not have a parallel valley, it does not have a stream going through it, it does not have a pillar of salt. If this is with Lot's wife, that is way too far south. That's about 600 miles too far south. It does not have fields, trees, grass, fruit, loam, fruit, loam. It does not have olive trees. There are no olive trees anywhere in the, in the Arabian Peninsula. The only olive trees that exist are in the Mediterranean, 600 miles further north. Olive trees have never existed that far south. Now take a look at this map here. This is a 7th century Byzantine map. What's missing? Right there. That's where Mecca is located today. It's not on this map. Here's a seventh century Arab trade route, and you can see where the Arab trade route goes. All the trade routes come here from the Silk Road. They all come to this area. They come along here, the Northern Plateau. This is the Northern Plateau, but they miss completely Mecca. When you look at official maps, you'll see this is a sixth century map. Mecca is not there. Doesn't exist on that map. Here's a 7th century map. This is the time Muhammad was living. There is no place called Mecca anywhere up the eastern coast, the western coast, sorry. Mecca still doesn't exist. And this is what has really puzzled cartographers. Because anybody should, I mean, every map should have Mecca if it's that important a city. If it's the oldest city in the history of mankind, if it's where Abraham lived, if it was a center of trade north, south, east, and west, why is it not on any map? Here's another 7th century map, still missing. Yet another century map, non-existent. Now this is a map looking back, done in the 20th century, looking back as to what Muslims thought. This is what map that Muslims have put together, saying that this is where Mecca exists. Dr. Patricia Corona looked at this map, and she saw that there was a problem with it. We do know that Mecca supposedly got its importance because it became the center of trade. That's why it was so important, north, south, east, and west. And that's why Muhammad became important because he was a trader himself. And she looked at this map here, and you can see here in Aden is where the trade route starts. It follows that green line, goes up along the western plateau. When it gets to Taif, suddenly goes down off the plateau, comes down to Mecca. That's over a thousand meters down, way too far down. Then it has to come back up and get up back onto the plateau to get up to Yathrib and the Khaibar Tabuk and then on up to Gaza in the north. That's known as the Western Trade Route along the plateau. When she looked at that, she said, hold on a minute. Why is this detour down to Mecca and back up to Yathrib, from Taif down to Mecca and back up to Yathrib? She was told that that's because um, they controlled the trade. That's why it had to come to Mecca. So she decided to go investigate this. Now remember, this woman reads and writes 15 languages, so she can go back and look at all the original documents. So she went to all the original documents from the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, went up to all the trading documents, went to documents that were written over here in India, documents that were written up here in Stesifan, which they later became the Hatta. She went in documents that were written on the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire. That's the Christian Empire, and then that's the and that's the Persian Empire. And she noticed that in the 5th and 6th century, these two empires started battling each other, the Persians and the Byzantines. And as they battled each other, that shut down the Persian Gulf. The trade used to come from the western coast of India up the Persian Gulf. That means the trade had to be rerouted over here to Aden. Now, Montgomery Watt is the one that came up with the theory, ah, that's why Mecca became important, because the trade was redirected down here and went up the Western Plateau, and they controlled the trade all the way up along the Western Plateau. Now, my 10-year-old son looked at this map, and he found a problem with that theory. Do any of you find a problem with that theory, looking at that map? 
Patricia Crone saw the problem of this theory real quickly. Let's see if you're as good as my 10 year old son. <laughs> Anybody want to venture a guess? No? This is a water, right? That's the Arabian Sea. You go up what, the Persian Sea, you can't go there, therefore you come this way. Why would you go along land 1,250 miles when you have a waterway right here? Why in the world did they take off the goods off the boat? Patricia Crone found that if you only go 50 miles by land, that's the same price as going 1,250 miles by sea. It is prohibitively expensive to go by land. Why? Because you have to protect the good. You have to preserve the goods. You have to have camels to carry them. You have to feed the camels. You have to have places to, to sequester them. You have to slay, live in a oasis. You have to pay taxes. And you have to make sure that no robbers come and rob you. Therefore, you have to secure them. That's why it's so expensive. That's why everything has been done by sea. Even today, when you get all your cars, the couple, I used to say it's in America from China. That now I can't say because you're in China. But from Japan, they have to come by sea. They don't come overland. Why? Because it's the it is the cheapest way to send large amounts of goods. It has always been the cheapest, even in the 21st century. Therefore, why in the world, she asked, would they take their ships down this direction, take them off here in Aden, go up through Nantanam Sana, up to Tai, down to Mecca, up to Yafrit, Kaiba, Kabul, Ganon, up to Gaza? It made no logical sense. So being a linguist, she went back to all the original documents and she read them, the first and the second and the third. She read them in Assyria. She read them in Arab, in Nabatea. She read all of the original documents and she found that there was no across, there was no trade whatsoever going up the Arabian Gulf. I'm sorry, the Arabian Peninsula. It was all maritime. Every bit of it was maritime. And it was not the Arabs who were in charge of it. It was the Eritreans over here. It was Agilus. Agilus is a city right here. That's where the Eritreans live today. It's, that is, those are the people that control the trade. Their names are all over the western coast of India. And she destroyed the trade route with just one book that she wrote in 1983. 1987. Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam. Read it. Chapter by chapter by chapter, she completely deconstructed the trade route. That's why she got her death threat. So then she decided, after looking at all this documentation, she wanted to find out when was the first time that Mecca is referred in any documentation. She scoured every text she could find. She even found references up here in Stesabon where they came across the deserts over to Yathbib right here, which lay in Medina. And she found that in Yathbib they had silver mines and they talked about the silver mine and they talked about Taib and they talked about Najan and they talked about Khaibah, but Khaibah uh, uh, and Khaibah, but they don't refer to Mecca once. No reference to Mecca in any of their documentation. Yet this is supposed to be the center of trade, the oldest city of, of mankind. Guess when she found the first reference to Mecca in any documentation? It was on the Apocalypse of Pseudomethodius Continuato Byzantia written in 741. Muhammad died in 632. Was born in 570, supposedly in the city that no one had heard about before. And for over a hundred years after Muhammad's death, there is no reference to this city at all. The first map that you will see Mecca finally displayed on it is not till 900 AD. That's the 10th century. Now, why have Muslims not told us this before? Let's look at modern Mecca today. Today, they have one of the largest, tallest buildings in the world, the fourth tallest in the world right there now, looking right over the Kaaba. It's the clock tower. About six or seven buildings have been around it. And that's gonna, they want now that to be the center of time. They want to make it Mecca mean time, to take it from Greenwich mean time. And they model it very much on on Big Ben from London itself. When you look at the future, this is what Mecca is going to look like. It's going to be all cemented over. Enormous structures, 62 different high, tall buildings, enormous buildings, skyscrapers are going to be surrounding the Kaaba. And when you do build buildings that tall, what do you do? Well, when you build buildings that tall, you got to build deep foundations, do you not? And when you did uh, build deep foundations, you move, you have to dig into the soil. And when you dig in the soil, in any major city, anywhere in the world, archaeologists come. And why do archaeologists come? Because they want to see what artifacts you dig up. If you dig up any uh, building in Jerusalem or in Amman or even possibly even here in Hong Kong, when the further you dig up your deep, the more you come across artifacts, because that's 
those are residue from, from former civilizations. So the archaeologists have come, and you can see they're digging in a lot. And what have they found? Absolutely nothing. Mecca has no history. There are no artifacts to find. There is no museum of any archaic residue in Mecca today. Can you see why this is such an embarrassment? And that's why now, it, I would assume, that they are now cementing everything over. They want to make sure that nobody does any investigation there anymore. Because there's nothing to find. If Mecca did not exist prior to seventh, the, the 8th century, then you need to ask, what are we going to do with the Qibla? Problem number three. And here's where the real rubber hits the fan. This is where the most damaging material I'm going to introduce now. And this is the material that now is going to co has caused Muslims lots of anger. And that's why we don't see many Muslims here today. They were told not to come here. Let's now move in to see what we're finding. If you're looking at the Kaaba, you need to ask about the Qibla. The Qibla is the direction of prayer. Every Muslim knows anywhere in the world that they are to pray towards Mecca. And they're given all kinds of accoutrement. When, uh, many mosques will have these mihrabs that are they're, they're, uh, positioned into the wall that show you the me that where uh, Mecca is that in every mosque around the world. When I was in Kuala Lumpur, there in my hotel room, I was had the Qibla pointing to me so I could know where I wanted to pray if I wanted to pray towards Mecca. You have now on your app phones, you can get it on your smartphones where the Qibla is. So today, every Muslim knows where Mecca is. There's no excuse not to know where Mecca is. And why? Because in Surah 2, Ayah 143 to 145, the direction of prayer is then dictated that it must be redirected from Jerusalem back down, but it doesn't say Mecca, just to the holy place. They have put Mecca there in the parentheses. So everybody has assumed that from 624 on, every Qibla in every mosque should be facing Mecca, right? Because there were no mosques before that time. Mosques, Islam really did not begin until the Caliphate began, and that's in 624. So every mosque that would have been built would have been after 624. Archaeology supports this challenge. Not from Jerusalem to Mecca, as Muslims suggest, but from some place further north. When back in 1905, two researchers in the Middle East, Dr. Fetherbadi and um, Dr. Creswell, were going around that part of the world. It was still open. They had not closed it to foreigners. And they were looking, and they were trying to find the earliest mosque that they could find. And they found the mosque in Fustat, which is outside of Cairo, the garrison town, built in 641. And that mosque was facing straight east. When they went to what is today Iraq, they went to the Wasit Mosque, built in 706, and that mosque, Qibla, was facing west. When they went to the Kufa Mosque, which is also in Iraq, that mosque was also facing west. So this is what they found. This mosque over here in Egypt was facing this direction, but it should have been facing this direction. These two mosques that are now in Iraq today were facing this direction, but it should have been facing this direction. They all thought that therefore they must have been facing. When you look at these maps, you will see they are off by three to five degrees for a very good reason. According to the documentary evidence, we have Jacob Medessa, a Christian writer, suggesting he refers to the Maghreb. So from all this, it is clear that it is not to the south of the Jews in the Maghreb, that means the Arabs, here in the regions of Syria, right? But towards Jerusalem or the Kaaba, the patriarchal places of their races. So even as late as 705, a Christian writer thought it was towards Jerusalem they were praying, because he didn't look at it very carefully. Of course, he didn't have GPS like we have today. That's where Dan Gidkiff comes in. Dan spent 25 years asking this question. And he wrote two books, well, Chronic Geography and now this book. And this is the book that now unpacks all of that. What he did is he personally went to every early mosque. He's the only one that I know of that has gone to all 65 of the earliest mosques. Physically gone there, studied them, looked and found where the Qiblas were for every one of these mosques took photographs of all the earliest mosques, and this is what he has found. Looking at all the numerous mosques, I'm going to go through very quickly what he has found, because otherwise this will take for hours. The earliest mosque they can talk about is the 626, known as the Mosque of the Two Qiblas in Medina. And it's always been called the Mosque of the Two Qiblas, but no one really understood why, because it's facing Mecca. So what's the second Qibla? Why is it called the Two Qiblas? 
It was only in 1987 that they found out why. When they started doing some refurbishment to the mosque and started digging down through the foundation, they found that there was a second Qibla this way. Here's the mosque, here's the Qibla facing Mecca. But they found an entirely new Qibla wall facing this direction, facing the complete opposite direction. Now they understood why it was always known as the Mosque of the Two Qiblas. So where is that second, earlier Qibla facing? Not Jerusalem, but Petra. 626. So this is before Muhammad died. You already have a mosque that is facing completely the wrong direction. In China, Guangzhou, Canton, as far as China, there's a mosque there, it's still there today. You can still look at the Qibla and look and see where the Qibla is. It was built in 627, it's facing Petra. As far away as Guangzhou. Now, I have heard many Muslims say, ah, so I'm using Google Earth, therefore it's very inaccurate. Listen, I am not, I didn't do this research, Dan Gibson did, he would never use Google Earth. Google Earth is much too inexact, and it follows a flat plane, it follows a flat Earth idea, because you have to have a flat Earth in order to drive. He did not use Google Earth, he used ArchNet, put out by MIT, the most sophisticated GPS formation so that you can see exact coordinates. He went to every one of these places and he used ArchNet to find their coordinates. That's why he could say, and he got these so accurate. Look at this one. That's Sharman Juma Mosque in India. Look at the date, 629. Muhammad died in 632. We're still before Muhammad's death. Look at the direction it's facing. It's facing Petra. The Jami Hama Al Kabir Mosque in Syria. Now we jump to Syria. Look where it's facing. It's facing Petra, not Mecca. The Fustat Mosque, the same mosque that Farabadi and Kresel had noticed back in 1905, over 100 years ago, Gibson found that they were completely wrong. They, it was not facing Jerusalem. It was off by three degrees to Jerusalem. Then it's facing Petra. Look at the date, 642. We're still in the seventh century. If you look, you can see carefully that it's still living, it's still existing. And then we get to the Dome of the Rock, 690, built in 690 by Abdul Malik. I told you I'd get back to his name. We're going to talk quite a bit about Abdul Malik. You'll see the significance. This is the Dome of the Rock in the Gorge, most, in fact, possibly the greatest building structure of its day, built in 690s or to 691. And look and see where it's facing. Now, I got caught up by this by Uncle Green back in the 1990s. And he said, you know, Jay, you have no idea what you're talking about. It is not facing south, it is facing, uh, we do know, and I said at that time that there was no Qibla on it. And he says, yes, there is a Qibla. If you look at the southern portico right there, you will see it talks about Surah 2, I-145. And if you look at the dome up here, there is Surah 17, I-1, which talks about the great mosque, uh, Muhammad, uh, not Muhammad, but the messenger going from the great mosque to the farthest mosque. That's talking about the Miraj. So therefore, he said, that's the Qibla where that's referring to, because that's both in the Quran and that's from the Quran. I had to get up and I had to say, well, you don't know your history as well. The Dome of the Rock has been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. That facade that you see here, this facade, that whole dome, this whole structure you're looking here on the outside, was built in 1867, a little over 100 years ago. So a little over 100 years ago, they had to put the Qibla in. But don't say that this is 690. In 690, there has never been a Qibla there. However, I'm going to go back on that. I'm going to lie. You're going to see me why I just lied because I'm going to completely con contradict myself in just a few minutes. Not because I say so, but because Gibson says so. Look at the Humayma Mosque in Jordan. The Humayma Mosque built in 699, where we're at the end of the 7th century, it's facing Petra, not Mecca. The Amman Mosque in Jordan in 701. Now we're moving into the 8th century. Muhammad died in 632. So now this is a good 70 years later, 60 years later. Look, what, look where it's facing. It's facing Petra, not Mecca. The Grand Mosque in Sana'a in Yemen, it's facing Petra in 705. The Kibba al minya Mosque in Israel, it's facing Petra. You can see right there, it's not facing Jerusalem, it's not facing Mecca, it's facing Petra. Notice how all of these mosques up until 706, every mosque up until 706, all of the Kiblas face Petra. In Jordan, 600 miles further north, nowhere near Mecca. 
Look how they all come exactly right to Petra. If you want to look at it from the back, from a distance, as far away as Guangzhou, Wasit, Kufa, Baghdad, India, they all face Petra. This is the coordinates looking from Archinet. This is a much more accurate form of doing it rather than using Google Earth. You can see they all come. All 17 Petra Kriptiblas, except for two, fall within 45 miles of the Dada Zone. These are coming from thousands of miles away. How did they get it so accurate? Look how accurate their Kiblas are. It is not till 706 that we finally get a Kibla that is not Petra, it is not Mecca, it's somewhere in between. And suddenly a new Kibla starts to form. A second Kibla. But it's not Mecca. It's somewhere in between. The Masjid Tarikana then goes back in Iran, that's facing Petra in 708. The Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Now here's what's interesting because the Al-Aqsa Mosque is built on the same citadel as the Dome of the Rock. Look at the entire citadel. This is built in 709. When you look at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is right here, and you look at the Dome of the Rock, which is right there, and you look at the entire citadel, which is still there standing today, the entire citadel is facing Petra. And you cannot change it unless you destroy it or rebuild it again. It's not facing Mecca. Even today it's not facing Mecca. And this is built in 709. That's built in 709, that's built in 691. The entire citadel is facing Petra, it's not facing Mecca. The Jami al Amun Kumawi al Kabir Mosque in Damascus in Syria, it's facing somewhere in between again. Here's that second Qibla. The Qibla al Mufjar Jericho in Israel is facing Petra in 714. The Anjad Mosque in Bossa, Syria, it's facing Petra. But also in Syria, the Mosque of Umar in Basra is facing in between. There is the second Qibla. So now we're getting two different Qiblas, but neither of them are Mecca. The Hayat al Yarbi Mosque in Syria is also facing in between, and it's almost facing in the exact place. In every one of these in between mosques, they're almost exactly at the same spot. It's not till we get to the Bangor Mosque in Pakistan, the first mosque anywhere in the world that faces Mecca. Look at the date 727. Muhammad died in 632. So according to the Quran, according to the traditions, the canonization of the Qibla was 624. This is over 103 years later. They finally get the first mosque that we've been able to find that's facing Mecca. But then, in 728, the Qasr al Mosque in Syria, it's facing in between again, that same spot, somewhere in between. When we get to the Amman Citadel Mosque in Jordan, it's facing Mecca. Here's what's interesting. Look at the date, 730. You have two different mosques here. Here is the earlier mosque, and here is the later mosque. This one is from 7, uh, I think it's 701. Let me get a, here's another picture, a better picture of it. This one here in uh, Amman, Jordan. This is the 701 mosque. That's facing Petra. Then it was a new mosque was rebuilt in 730 that's facing Mecca. So there is 30 years between these two mosques. That one's facing Mecca, I'm sorry, Petra, that one's facing Mecca. What happened between 701 and 730? That's what we need to answer. Jami al Zaituni Mosque in Tunisia. Now we get to North Africa. And when you get to North Africa, you get a fourth Qibla. Not one, not two, not three, but four different Qiblas. Here is, is what we call the parallel Qiblas. These Qiblas all face parallel to line that goes between Mecca and Petra. A fourth Qibla. The Baalbek Mosque in Lebanon it goes back to that in-between Qibla. That's the number two Qibla. The Mushta Mosque built in Jordan in 743, it faces back to Petra again, like the earliest mosques. Here you have the Haram Mosque in Turkey. It's in-between again, like the second Qibla. So there's Qibla number two. The Qasa Luka. Uh, Kufak Mas, that is finally facing Mecca. Look at the date, 764, so we're now halfway through the 8th century. We get to the Ribak Force Tut, there is the parallel again, that's North Africa, that's the fourth Qibla. The Saadi Ramda Bawar in Oman, that's facing Qibla number one, the first Qibla, Petra. So there's still mosques being built, even as late as 771, that are facing Petra. Here is the Sumayi. Omani Mosque in Oman, it's facing Petra. Look at the date, 771. The Raqqa Mosque that has just been taken over by the coalition forces just this week. 
It's in Syria. It's somewhere in between the second Qibla. When you get to Uzbekistan, you can see the Bibi Sabarkar Mosque is facing Petra, though some people say it could also face Jerusalem because it goes right through Petra to Jerusalem from that angle. But either way, the Cordoba Mosque in Spain is that parallel, that fourth Qibla again. The Jami Mukba, Ibn Nafid, Khud Karuan Mosque in Tunisia, it's that parallel mosque. There it is. All the mosques in North Africa are facing straight south. Not east, not southeast, but straight south. So when you look at these four Qiblas, all the Qiblas were facing Petra up until 706. There was a confusion for the next hundred years. 17 of them faced Petra, 8 are between, 6 are parallel, and only 10 face Mecca. The Qibla was not finalized towards Mecca until 876, the late 9th century, almost 250 years too late. And from that time on, all the Qiblas. So let's just review what we talked about. This is Qibla number one. Here it is, all these mosques from all over the world, India, all the way from China, just north of here, right towards Petra up until 607, sorry, 706. All of them, all faced there. Then you have a second Qibla, which is even more accurate, that's somewhere in between. See, there's Petra, here's Mecca, it's almost exactly in between. There's something going on here that we need to find out. Then you have the parallel Qibla, so this is the fourth Qibla, that parallels the line between Petra and Mecca, and all these North African mosques are facing straight this way. They're not facing this way, they're not facing that way, they're facing straight up and down. It's not till 727 that you first get the first mosque facing Mecca. And it's not till 876, the late 9th century, this is almost, well, this is almost 150 years after Muhammad, that finally all the mosques begin to face Mecca. Note which Qiblas are the most accurate. And I've heard many Muslims say, well, yes, that's just because the Muslims, the Arabs didn't know how to, their direction. They were just confused by their direction. They were very primitive. Well, if that were the case, why is it? That when you look at all the Petra mosques, they're off by 2.9 degrees. When you look at all the between mosques, they're off by 0.98, less than a degree off. When you look at all the parallel mosques, they're 3.5. And when you look at all the Meccan mosques, they're off by 4.78. If anything, it's the later uh, Qiblas that are the most inaccurate. The ones going to Mecca are the most inaccurate of all the Qiblas. So you can't do that theory anymore. Throw that out the window. Why Petra? Why were all the mosques facing Petra? To do that, you need to look and see where Petra is. Take a look where Petra is. It's right in the center of all the trade. All the trade went through Petra. So what is Petra? Well, it was the sanctuary of the Umayyads. It was a sanctuary before that of the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans were ones that controlled Petra. When you go to Petra today, you will see it's where there are tombs and temples. Any of you have been to Petra? Have any of you had a chance to go there? It's a beautiful place to go. And when you look there, you will see it is all these temples carved out of sheer rock. Beautiful carvings. Whole cities that have been carved out of sheer rock. And it was the center of the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans were there from the second century BC. They controlled that whole area. They were the ones that give us Arabic. Arabic language comes from the Nabataean language. The name for God in Arabic is Allah. Allah is a Nabataean God. Allah is the name of the Nabataean God. They seem the, the superior God. Also, Hubal is another name. Is that another formal name for Allah? Interestingly, the Nabataean Allah has a wife named Alat and Al Uza, which means Allah has a wife. I had no idea, which means the Nabataean Allah is a pagan god and a polytheistic god. So when Muslims say that Allah is one, then I would like to know what they're going to do with the Nabataean Allah, which is where they got the name from. Do you see the problem with using the name Allah? It's the wrong name. It's a pagan name. It's a polytheistic name. It's a pre-Islamic name. It is not a Christian name. It is not a biblical name. The name for God in the Bible is not Allah. It is Yahweh. Yahweh has no wife. But Yahweh has a son. Isn't that interesting? Make sure you get the right name. What's fascinating to me is that most Muslims here tonight should know where Alat and al uzza are, because that's in the Quran, in Surah 53, Ayah 19 to 20. Am I correct, Tariq? 
in Surah 253, Ayah 19 to 20, you have reference to Alat, Al Manat, and Al Uzza. These are known as the satanic verses. These are the three goddesses that supposedly Muhammad introduced into the Quran. Satan supposedly seduced him by letting those verses in. And that's why Gabriel, when he moved to Medina, says to excise to take out those verses. He took out those verses, but he left the three names there. And they're still there today. And these are the name, this is the satanic verses that Salman Rushdie made famous in his book called The Satanic Verses. Every Muslim scholar knows about these satanic verses. Now we now know where Allah and Al-Maluza come from. These are the two goddesses who have the same name that is the wife. Alat is the feminine form of Allah. That's why it makes sense now. That's why Allah is the wrong God. They, whoever put the Quran together, should never have used that name and never have said this God is one. Because they, Alat and al Uzza and Allah, all belong to the same God and his family. Now, when you look at Petra, take a look at Petra. Petra is in a valley. It has a parallel valley. There you can see the valley. You can see the parallel valley. It has a stream going right through it. There's path. It has a number of streams. It has field. It has tree. It has grass. It has clay. It has loam. It has all of trees. Everything that we see in the Quran about the city where this prophet comes from fits Petra. Not one of these geographical locations fits Mecca. Petra has all the items listed in the Quran. Thus, could Petra be the place that the Quran is referring to. When we look at Petra even more closely, we find that the people in Ad, which are mentioned 23 times in the Quran, the people from Thabud, which are mentioned 24 times, and the people from Midian, who are mentioned seven times, all are around Petra. Now can you see why this prophet had so much contact with these people from these cities? Because he was right next door to them. If he'd been way down here, he'd have to take a helicopter every day to meet them. They didn't have helicopters back then. That's why you have to make sure that if you're going to come and look at the historical record, you've got to get the right man in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time. It looks like they don't have any of that. Now, the significance of that, nothing is known about Muhammad until the late 7th century from within Arab sources. His biography, the Sirah, and his sayings, the Hadith, did not appear until the 9th century. His city, Mecca, isn't referred to until the 8th century. Thus, much of what we know of Muhammad is either written down hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away. It looks like he is nothing more than a later redaction. He's been put back by the later writers and put in post into the wrong place. It looks like he's nothing more than a redaction, possibly by Abdul Malik. Why do I bring up Abdul Malik? He is highly significant. Humphreys looks at and he says, Islam and the Prophet's life as we know it was not derived from the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years and redacted back from the Prophet's life and compiled possibly in the 9th century. Now, let's summarize and then we're going to come and finally put or bring it all to a conclusion. New books and documentaries are being published with question the classical account of Islam's beginning. Why are there no Muslim sources for 200 years? That's the first question. Why do the claims they make not fit the historical record? Why are all the geographical references so few and confused? Why do they all seem much further north? They're not in the right place. They've got the wrong person at the wrong place. Why are there so many references to vegetation which would not exist in Mecca at that time? Why is Mecca not mentioned until 741, nor included in any map until, map until the 900s? Why is Mecca not on the trade route? Why do all the Qiblas face Petra for the first hundred years, then are confused the next hundred, and aren't standardized to Mecca until 822, 200 years too late? Therefore, much of what we know about early Islam is in doubt. So, what really happened? What is going on? Now, I'm not going to say stand here and tell you I know what happened. We don't know yet. This is all coming out in just this last year. There's an awful lot yet we need to start looking at. We need to know on why is that there's four different Qiblas. What's interesting, these four are exact. They are absolutely the same Qiblas, and that shows that there is something happening politically. What we can, and only what I'm going to do now, is what we think is happening, okay? Now, in a year from now, it might be completely changed. Because as we're now digging more, as we're going there, as we're looking out more, we're starting to get more and more information all the time. This is brand new, so everything you're hearing today is the first time you've heard it. This is why it's now sprinkling down, getting into the academia. The academics are very interested in what's happening here, because for the first time, we're getting an entire different narrative than what Islam has been telling us, not for 1,400 years, but for 1,300 years. And that's why what I'm gonna say next is nothing more than supposition. Or okay, let me repeat that. It's nothing more than what we think has went on so far 
at this time. What we need to do is we need to look at what we do know, and what we do know is there was a, the Umayyads is, where, did exist, the Umayyads were a very real empire. They did begin in 661. We don't know beforehand where they came from. We do know that they were headquartered in Damascus. Now that's the first problem. Why in Damascus? Way up north. If they were Muslims, why weren't they headquartered down in Medina or Mecca? Why has no one asked this question? Damascus is not just 600 miles away, it's over a thousand miles away. We also know that their sanctuary was Petra, that the Umayyad sanctuary was Petra, it was never Mecca, it was always Petra. That's why Petra is such a great city, and that's why it is talked about, there's so much reference to it. But we do know that Abdullah ibn Zubair was the governor of Petra, and he rebelled against the Umayyads. In fact, he rebelled against the Sufyan, the Marwanid family, in 683, against the father of Abdul Malik. He rebelled against him, and what he did, he destroyed the Kaaba in Petra. Did you hear me say Kaaba? Yes, there were Kaabas in every major city. There is not just one Kaaba. That's another thing Muslims haven't told us. We have been looking at reference after reference. Almost every major city had a Kaaba. But these were Nabataean Kaabas. Isn't that fascinating? Zubair, when he left, he rebelled against the Marwanids. He destroyed the Kaaba in 683 against the Umayyad power in Damascus. He destroys the Kaaba in Petra and takes the black stone with him. The black stone, where have we heard about the black stone before? Where is it today? It's in Mecca. It's in the Kaaba. It's in the northeast corner of the Kaaba, encased in silver. What in the world is that black stone doing in the middle of the Kaaba? Remember, remember, Muslims are not supposed to pray to anything. There is no other God but God. What in the world is a black stone doing in the holiest place of all of Islam? And why do Muslims kiss it? See, I've asked this for so many Muslims and no Muslim can give me a response. I will tell you the reason, because this is a Nabataean custom. The Nabataeans believe that wherever the black stone was, God's presence was there. Why? Because this was a meteorite that came from the heavens. They saw it come from the heavens, and therefore they worshipped it. So Zubair takes the black stone with him, and by taking the black stone with him, he takes God's presence with him. This was a huge affront to the Umayyads. That's why they came from Damascus to come and destroy Zubair. By the time they got there, one of their own died. So Abdul Malik at this time had to return home quickly, and they had to go back up to Damascus again. We know that from history. That's all in the history. Now you can see by looking at the map here, Damascus is way up here. Mecca is way down here. Petra is right here. Why in the world would they, if this is their sanctuary for all of their, for all of their theology, why would they make their political office way up here and, and not down here? Muslims have not looked at history. But hold on a minute. We know nothing about this part of history from Islam. Remember, history only begins to appear in the ninth century. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. We'll come back to that. So Abdul Malik, who reigns from 685 to 705, that's well documented, way up in Damascus, not Medina, not Mecca, he needs an Arab identity. He realizes that he has to have an Arab identity. They had taken over Basra, Magna, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo by 652. So for 40 years now, they now control these great cities of the Levant. By this time, they moved all the trade across North Africa, all the way up to Andalusia, which is Spain. And they moved all the way over to the east, over to India. So from India over to, to Spain, all that land was under their control. But they do not have any identity. They had to make, because many of them were nomadic, they didn't even know how to run cities. They had to have the Jews and the Christians run the cities for them. And the reason they chose Jews and Christians, because they both were brothers from Abraham. They were both part of the Ali Qadab. The problem was, the Jews and Christians had a prophetic line. The Jews and the Christians had a book. They were part of the Ali Qadab. The Arabs had no book. They had no prophet. For 40 years, they have been the political heads, and that's why Abdul Malik, very curiously, Abdul Malik needs to have this Arab identity. How do you create an Arab identity, identity that is greater than the Jews and the Christians that you're dependent on, that you are also in competition with? Because the great empire of the day at that time was the Byzantine Empire. That was the Christian Empire. How can you defeat the Christian Empire and create your own identity that's equal or better to theirs? What do you do? Abdul Malik comes up with a plan, and you can see what he does. The coins, if you look at the coins in the British Museum uh, numismatic section, you will see that these are 
the Byzantine dinar. And you look, there is the emperor with two, two um, uh, uh, retainers on either side. On the back side of the coin is the Byzantine cross. So it's very clear this is a Christian coin. Now, in order for them to trade, once the Arabs take over power there in 661, once the Umayyad dynasty comes forth, they have to have coins that they can trade with the Byzantines. So what do they do? They create these Sufyani dirhams. And there is, instead of the emperor, they now have the caliph. They have the Umar Muawiyah and his two retainers. And they now, instead of the Byzantine cross, they take the cross piece off, so it's not a cross, but it's still recognizable as the same coin. That's how they can now trade with their, their, their neighbors. But since when are Muslims allowed to have images on coins? This is obviously nothing to do with Islam. This is long before Islam. But this is 660, this is 670, this is 680, this is up until 685. This is supposedly the first Muslim empire. Who in the world, on what Muslim empire would ever have images on their coins? And the cross on the backside of it. Why haven't we been told this? Then you get to Abd al-Malak, and he, he coins this coin of himself. There he is on the coin. This is 685 to 705 that he was in power. Then in 691, he takes off these coins and he introduces these coins in 692. Take a look, he takes all, all the images off, no longer has image, so something happens in 691 and he introduces this coin. Take a look what's on the coin, the Shahada. There is only one God but God, and Muhammad is the prophet of God. This is the first time we see Muhammad's name anywhere on any documentation, introduced by Abd al Malik in 692. Muhammad died in 632. His name didn't appear prior to 692. For 60 years, we've not seen his name anywhere until Abd al Malik introduces it on these coins. At the same time, he then entered and builds this Dome of the Rock in 691, the year before. And I'm sorry, did I say it was the first time it was introduced? Actually, it was introduced a year before. And that building, we'll get to that. He builds this building, the greatest structure of its day, in the middle of Jerusalem. Why do you build it in Jerusalem? Why don't you build it in Damascus? And if Mecca existed, why don't you build it in Mecca? Well, because there was no Mecca. There's no reference to any Mecca at all, not until 741, and we're still back in 691. So what does he do? Take a look at what he does. He builds it above the Church of the Sepulchre. There's the Church of the Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which is the theological head for all Christianity. He takes it and he builds it along the hill above it, looking down onto it, basically saying, we are the new men in town. We are now going to build the largest structure of our day, looking down upon you Christians, and we're going to do something significant with this building. It's the greatest building of its time. That's why it's still there today. Take a look at it. When you go to Jerusalem, you have to see it. It's one of the most beautiful buildings even today. But look and see what he does. He doesn't just build the building. He uses the same Byzantine architecture, so it's a one-upmanship because he's using the same Byzantine architecture as the Christians, but a much larger and a more prominent structure in the holiest city of Jews and Christians, basically saying, we're in the new man in town. That's why he didn't build in Damascus, and the reason he didn't build in Mecca, because Mecca didn't even exist that time. It is because of the Mirage. Is this because of the Mirage? This is what Muslims tell me today, that it was built because of the Mirage. Well, I would like to know. If that was so, then there's something written about it, right? So what you need to do, you need to go back to the only part of the Dome of the Rock that is original. See, the building's been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. Did I tell you that earlier? And the only part of the building that still exists today are these two inner ambulatories. The both these two, that one there and this one here. That's the only original part of the building that still exists today. And when you look at those ambulatories, you need to look at the inscriptions. You need to look at the inscriptions up there and the inscriptions up here. Those are the original part of the inscriptions from 691. Take a look at them. They are written in Arabic and look and see what they say. This is the first Quranic material we see anywhere in the world. This is the first Quranic material that has come to light, and it's on the Dome of the Rock. So what do you say? You have Surah 4, Ayah 171. O people of the scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter aught concerning Allah, save the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah, and his word which he conveyed unto Mary, and his spirit for him. So believe in Allah and his messenger, and say not three, cease. It is better for you, Allah is one and only God, for is it far removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. Who is that attacking? That's attacking the Trinity, that's attacking Jesus, that's attacking his divinity, 
and his sonship, all four in one. That's why Surah 4, 171 is the earliest Quranic reference we have, and it's right there on the Dome of the Rock. Surah 17, I 11, 111, Praise be to God, who hath not taken unto him a son. Who's that attacking? Jesus again. And who hath no partner. Who's that attacking? Supposedly, the fact that Jesus is the partner of God. Nor hath he any protecting friend through dependence. And then we get to the mother, though. This is the big verse. There is no God but God. He is one. He has no associate. Now, that's not part of this, so the Shabbat today. That was a piece that it was added in the Shabbat that no longer exists today. So even the Shabbat is not the same. He is God, the one, God, the eternally besought of all. He begetteth not, nor was begotten. Who's that attacking? Jesus again. And there is none comparable to, comparable to him. Muhammad is the messenger of God. This is the first time we see Muhammad's name introduced on the Dome of the Rock in 691 on Surah 12, which later became Surah 12. We now know today is Surah 12. It wasn't then. There was no Surah titles. There was no reference. Fascinating. They finally got their own prophet, built on the largest building of its day, of the Moloch introduces his Arab identity, beginning with the Dome of the Rock. It's larger than any other non-Arab structure. It's facing the Arab sanctuary Petra. It incorporates inscriptions against Byzantine Christianity. It introduces their faith. That's where you see the word Islam first introduced. That's where you see the people Muslim introduced. And that's where you see their prophet Muhammad introduced. At the same time, and this is Jehuda Nebo. Dr. Jehuda Nebo did a research on all the protocols. These are the official documents put out by the Cato. From the Sufiani period from 661, every one of the Cato for protocols say nothing about Muhammad, say nothing about Islam. There's no reference to people called Muslim, and there's no reference to any book called the Quran. Now that's rather curious. If these are the first Muslims, and these are the, of the original documents, these are the official documents of the Caliphs of the Sufiani family, why don't they say the three most important things? Why don't they talk about who they are? Why don't they talk about their faith? Why don't they talk about the book? And why don't they talk about the man? The book and the man are completely missing. Dr. Yehuda never noticed there's even a bismillah, but the bismillah is not the same bismillah we use today. These protocols continue year after year from 660 up in the 670, 680. By the time you get to 691, when of the monarchs pray protocols, he says, in almost overnight, suddenly, the Shahada is introduced. There is only one God but God. He has no associates. Muhammad is his prophet. It is introduced the same time that the Dome of the Rock is built. Simultaneously, the same time that this is introduced on the coins. So Abdul Malik not only introduces it on the Caliph of Protocols, he introduces it on the Dome of the Rock, he also introduces it on the coins. He is now creating an Arab identity. Now they have a prophet, their own prophet. But in order to have a prophet, you have to get a book. Every prophet has to have a revelation. And here's the problem. There is no book. Can you now understand why all the earliest Qurans begin to appear after Abdul Malik? Or during the time of Abdul Malik? And that's why the Tokapi, the Samakan, the Ma'il, the Petropolis, the Sana manuscript, the Husseini manuscript are all begin to appear in the 8th and 9th century. And that's why every one of these manuscripts starts getting manipulated. Every one of these manuscripts is incomplete. Not one of them agrees with each other. They do not agree with the Quran we have today. Why? Because you have four different schools of manuscripts. You have one school up in Damascus that is known as the Ubay bin Qab's Manuscript Codex. You have another school in Masla that's known as Ibn Musa's Manu uh, Codex. You have another school in Baghdad that's known as Ubay, uh, sorry, is, is known as Ibn Masud's Codex. And then you have another codex that comes out of Medina that's known as Zayd ibn Thabit's. Four different codices. Not one of them agrees with each other, but reference after reference that these are vying for ascendancy. And that's why all of this happens in the 8th century. None of it happens in the 7th century. You've got the building, the earliest chronic texts on the, are on the Dome of the Rock in 691. The earliest chronic manuscripts, but they don't even agree with the Quran we have today. The earliest chronic manuscripts begin to appear during his reign and his son Al Walid and on and on. None of them are complete, none of them parallel today's Quran. They continue to be changed and corrected by later cadres. We saw that on Wednesday. So what is happening? You have two empires that are competing. The sanctuary in Petra is destroyed by an earthquake in 730. That's well documented. 
And when an earthquake comes and destroys a sanctuary, God's presence leaves. This is well known in ancient and ancient medieval times. Thus a new place is needed. That's why Mecca had to be chosen. Possibly chosen by the rebel of the of Zubair and those from Kufa. The Kufa over in Persia, remember you have you have Abdel Malik and the Umayyads up in Damascus. Over in Baghdad, you have another group that are hated by the Umayyads. They are the Abbasids. The Abbasids hate the Umayyads, the Umayyads hate the Abbasids. The Abbasids are part of the Persian, raising the Persian hegemony. Persians were destroyed by the Arabs, and that's why they hated them so much. So they were already, already vying for ascendancy. So you can see already Zubair then joins with the Persians when he takes the black stone and he rebels in 687. The Abbasids and Zubair with their, uh, create their sanctuary in Mecca, then demand allegiance. All those Qiblas facing Mecca are theirs. But their first mosque that is even built is not till 727, 100 years after Muhammad died. So here you have one group that are now creating a whole new sanctuary. The political, the political head is in Baghdad, but they all, they don't have, in every case, you never have the political uh, center the same as the religious center. That's why in, uh, the Umayyads have their political center up in Damascus, but their religious center is in Petra, because that's the Nabataean center for the sanctuary. So here you have the Abbasids have to have a new sanctuary. It's some, according to some references, it looks like Zubair came from Mecca. That's probably why Mecca was chosen. But that's why it has no history. There is no history there. There is nothing that goes back. That's why they can't find any artifacts. al hajjaj also rebels. He is the governor in 705. He rebels, and it, is, it, it looks like it is his mosque, which are facing between the other two sanctuaries. So that's why you get a second Qibla, because you have another rebellion. This is a political rebellion. Those in North Africa and Andalus don't show allegiance to either empire, so they have mosques facing parallel to either, each sanctuary. So then you get a fourth Qibla. Now you have four different Qiblas, four different political situations, two, two different uh, empires who are vying for ascendancy. Can you then understand why you have four different directions? When the Abbasids finally overpower the Umayyads in 749, they become the new power. Most of all the killers then face Mecca with few holdouts until 822 when they all face Mecca. And from that time on, every mosque has faced Mecca. Basically, what you have here is you have a political tug of war going on. This makes sense. That's exactly what happens. And depending on who you support, if you support the Umayyad, then you, your mosque in your city faces Petra. If you support the Abbasids, then your mosque facing where in your city faces Mecca. Or if you don't like either, you face somewhere in between. Now that the Muslims have a prophet, Muhammad, a revelation, the Quran, a sanctuary, Mecca, they need a history. Can you then understand why this man's history doesn't get written down until the ninth century? It takes him another hundred years to finally get it written down. And then his hadith don't get written down until the late ninth century. See, this is what's curious. No one's ever bothered to answer this question. Why was Bukhari given 600,000 of these sayings and he throws away 98% of them? There must be an agenda there. Obviously, he only retained 2% because these are the only 2% that fit their narrative. That's why there was a manipulation that continues for 200 years. Once the Hadith got started to compile, then the Tafsir, then they got to start translating and making sense of this book. And that's why the commentaries don't even begin to appear to the 10th century. By the 9th century, they, they have a book, the man, the place, and the story. A new religion is formed and growing, yet did not happen within a period of 22 years. It evolved from a period of two to 300 years. So what about Muhammad? Since much of what we know about early Islam is in doubt, since much of the Quran is also in doubt, since nothing is known of Muhammad until the late 7th century, or Mecca until the 8th century, or his story until the 9th century, hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away, can we conclude that Islam is nothing more than a later redaction, possibly begun by Abdul Malik, then continued by his descendants, proving Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran? So who is he and what is his purpose? It looks like the Muslims have the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. What about Jesus? We know where Jesus was born? In Bethlehem. That's not dispute. We know where Jesus grew up? In Nazareth. That's not a dispute. We know where Jesus died? And when? In Jerusalem. That's not a dispute. We know what Jesus did, the last three years especially. That's not a dispute. 
We know from eyewitness accounts exactly what he said and what he did from Matthew and John himself. We know from hostile accounts, even from Pallas and Tassus and Joseph, but these are Greek, Roman, and Jewish historians exactly when he died and where he died. We know when they were written, between 15 to 60 years later. Few doubt his historicity today. Thus we have the right man at the right place, doing the right thing at the right time. So where do we go from here? Historians set the stage, we move it on. The questions they ask, we research and expand. We must confront Islam's historical foundations. We must challenge Muhammad in the Quran. We must demand the same of both all books, not just our Bible, but also Jesus Christ himself. We must bring both into the public sphere and then let people come to their own conclusions. Why? Because similar historical questions have already been asked of Christianity, and every one of them have been answered. We need to bring our friends home. I will bring out the questions. Thank you, Jim, for all your presentation. I appreciate very much. It's very good. I'm Bernard uh, from Soviet Lectures. Just would like to ask about uh, the claim of some interfaith uh, dialogue between Muslim and Christians. Uh, mostly when they speak about the word Allah, it's come from the word Allah, which is referring to the Sita text in the first century. I mean, they're saying that the claim of the histories on the winners. Uh, so it seems like, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but based upon your presentation, it's much more of the Western flavor of historical uh, construction. So uh, <laughs> uh, what, what do you think about the connection with the, the Pesita text of the world uh, with the Medina Charter that most of the Muslim claim that this is the proof, the evidence of existence of Muhammad in, in a multipolaristic uh, society? Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not getting that last question. What would I mean? <coughs> Pull it away from your mouth a bit. You're, you're just too much. Yeah, breath. what I'm saying is, uh, uh, is there a historical connection between the, the claim, or which is many of the Christians and uh, Muslim interfaith dialogue, when they always refer to the Pesita text? Pesita text, yeah. yeah it was mostly the Martum Orthodox, so they, they are referring to that manner as uh, doing the constructive of the word Allah into the word Allah, which is uh, referring to the uh, first century of the written of this text. Okay, and, uh, and let me see if I could get your question right. Is the Allah, or Elohim, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. yeah. The Elohim sure. is the same as Allah. Yeah. I have no problem with that. I think that's exactly what your question is. Is that not therefore the name for Allah in the first century? No, well, I mean, my question is, is there any connection from the historical evidence because the Martum and Syrian Orthodox Church already in the first time of the first century, they already exist and the Bible is already uh, canonized within their hands. And this is becoming the base whereby the Muslim and the Christian, when they have into the dialogue, they're referring into this uh, uh, man. They're always looking to the Eastern source for them. Are you from the Martoma Church? No, 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 I'm a Pentecostal evangelical no, church. <laughs> is there any text from the Martoma Church that's 2,000 years old? Yeah, that is Peshita, until now. Peshita is yes. from the fourth century. It's not from the first century. Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it already exists until now, the Martoma Orthodox okay, The church. Martoma make lots of claims that they cannot support. I don't know of any Martoma uh, uh, I codex so. that is from the first century. Which is much more older than the presentation of Muslim. They are older than even Muslim. Okay. It's, yeah. well, that's yeah. I just would like ask your preference and your command. About okay. Let me ask you this, sir. Do you know where the oldest Peshta is? Yeah, of course. It's in Where's Syria. It? It's a Jordan. It's not. It's actually in Dublin. It's in the Chester B. Manuscripts. The part claim of colonization in the London Museum has been refuted by the, the, mostly of the Sir, do you believe that the oldest, are, are you suggesting that the that, that, That's okay, you can claim your source. What well, I'm saying is, what is your command on the word of the Peshitta, which is in the first century, that becoming the reference for the Muslim and... Uh, I don't Peshitta. believe it is the first century, it's a fourth century document. It's a, it is Syriac, that is true. Can you, get, uh, even the name can, can you give me your, your historical, the first hand sources about these things? Fourth century I can, but not first century. I'm asking you. So you're you also doubting that the word Allah, Allah, Allah in the Pashita text is not in the first century? Fourth century. Did, am, I, am I being clear? It's the fourth century. It's not first century. 
Can you recommend any uh, document? There is no document from the first century, sir. I don't, we don't even have a biblical document from the first century. Oh, no, you're referring to the biblical. What I'm saying is that your, your secular source, your first hand source, that you as a historian, as right. apologist, can, can claim. I mean, I would like to know that. Where do you get the first hand Very source? Very simple. Let me say it again. I've now said it five times. The earliest Peshta, which is Syriac document, mm -hmm. the Peshta is amalgamation of the four Gospels. Yeah. Okay? It was written by um, Tatian. Tatian lived Tatian. in the late third century. Yeah. So how could it be a first century document? Oh, now you're referring to the Peshta. That's why I claim. From the Peshitian into your modern time, is there yeah. any intermediate first hand source that can claim this Peshita? The Peshitian text or the Mantum of Turkshir, they're already there. And we have this handed down until this very. I can imagine the Martomo say everything. I'm from India. I know that every Indian likes to exaggerate. But there has been no I mean, Indian reference. That's to why my, 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 my senses is. Uh, so are you a Martoman? No, no, no. I so why do you have to have any of the you know? no, I, Well, we read as a pastor, we have to know the sources, right? Okay. Very clearly. Yeah. I would, and I would ask you to go back to the Martoma, which is the church in Kerala. The Martoma, they do believe that Thomas went to Kerala. That's, I don't sit there and doubt that. But what I do doubt is that they can produce a text from the first century. The reconstruction for language of philologies of Suriani, Eastern Syria and Western Syria has been claimed by many historical. Yeah, give me one name of one historian that claims. Oh yeah, Arnold J. Toynbee has already said Toynbee? That. Yeah. When did Toynbee die? In the 1800s. You're, you're talking about somebody that is not even part of modern history. Yeah, really? yeah. Okay, yeah. so when did we get it? What's yeah. your question is, yeah. is the, uh, yeah. let's assume that the Syria, the earliest Syria question that we have today <laughs> is in the British, is, is, sorry, is in the Chester Beatty manuscript, is in the Chester Beatty library. I don't think so. Yeah, the Western well, Kingdom, the Western, sir, Western I, I, Kingdom, I, I, Eastern. I don't know of any scholar that would agree yeah. with what you just said. I appreciate said. your presentation. Yeah. You're much more your favor on the Western view on Islam. But the okay, well, question is, is the Allah that's in the Peshta, is that the same Correct. as the Allah Correct. in the Quran? I appreciate it. That's why I want to know your preferences I on the word no of Allah and Allah in the Peshta. I would have text. no difficulty believing it is, but is, mm -hmm. it the same God, is it the same name as Yahweh? We are not talking about the theory of transliteration of the Bible. I'm talking about what the I'm saying is some in Islamic and the Christians, when they have it written down, they're always reading. That is my first introduction when I'm I'm sorry, Is anybody following what his question is? I'm not following his question. No. What is your question then? Then my question is, how do you view about the Peshitta text, right. about the word Allah in the first century is already within their hands in the traditions of Oran? That which is now being referred by some Oh, okay. So let, let's forget about the Peshta. Let's just talk about the name Allah. I'm sure Allah existed. It existed from the second century BC. The Nabataeans got his name is Allah. Yeah, my question so, is not finished. What I'm saying is, yeah. this is the basis that which is some Islam claim that they have the historical evidence of existence about the many okay. charter. You know? okay. I, I just want to see what your view What's your name, by the way? I'm Bernard. But I would yeah. suggest, yes, go ahead and say that. And what I would say to those Muslims is be careful because what you're doing is you're actually falling into the trap of admitting that Allah, that your God Allah, is actually pre-Islamic. He is pre-Islamic. I said that already earlier tonight, did I not? He is a Nabataean God. That means he was, that name has been around since the second century BC. Nabataeans were the ones that gave Allah its language. The Arabic language comes from the Nabataean language. It is the precursor to the uh, Arabic. So it would not surprise me. I'm not. I'm going to dispute you on the date of the text, but it would not surprise me that the name itself has always been around since the second century BC, and it is a pagan Nabataean god. So if Muslims want to claim that this is the god there that they have in their Quran, they can have that god. I don't want that god because that god has a white name, Alat. That means that already you have a duality in the Godhead. So how can that god be one if he has a wife? Ooh, I love that. Because that completely confronts Surah 6, Ayah 101, which says that God cannot have us concert. If whoever put the Quran together had known that, they would never have chosen the name Allah. They would never have gone to the Nabataeans for their God. They should have gone to the Jews and Christians, who were their next door neighbors, to go to the real name for God, Yahweh. Because Yahweh does not have a wife. Yahweh is one has always been, for 3,400 years we've known about that name. Since Moses received that name in Exodus 3, verse 14 and 15, that's the name that they should have used, and you will not find that name in this book. If that name, the, 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 
personal name for God, the eternal name for God, the holy name for God, the eternal name that even today Jews will not repeat audibly. If that name is not in this book, then how can Muhammad claim to be a prophet if he didn't even know God's personal name? He didn't even know what God he was representing. And I would suggest that Muslims must be careful about pushing the name Allah, because Allah is a pagan God, a polytheistic God, and is not the one God that we're looking for. Okay? Thank you. Let's give it. At the very back, before I thought it was your film, but film. Okay. Thanks very much, Jay. Uh, again, uh, really uh, lots of new information. Um, this history seems very, very complex. Um, when, when we look at the classic interpretation, the classic histories of the Quran, there does seem to be a sort of Quranic development in the beginning. The early Meccan verses are very peaceful. Muhammad goes uh, in the Hijra to Medina, he, he builds up a, a great following and the, the verses become more aggressive and warlike and then finally of course he comes back to Mecca. So that there seems to be a history there uh, and from what you said today, um, Abu Malik seems to have constructed uh, a, a, a history around Muhammad, but there, there does seem to be a real history. Muhammad seems to have been a real person. You got all these stories about him, so there must there must be a history there. Um, Real quickly, Bill, is yeah. the name Muhammad in the Quran more than four times? No. So who is that man that re they keep referring to well, as this Rasul, the representative of the yeah. Prophet of God? Where do, who do you think that person may be? So. Uh, my, my Even in the modern day Quran, yeah. the modern day Quran. My, my, my sort of question would be, well, where, where did the, all these hadith come from? Uh, with the, the prophet said this, who is the prophet? What, in your understanding? Okay. Let me do, let me, let me do, answer that with two different ways of right. saying that. Okay. First and foremost, if you look at the Quran, how was the Quran constructed? It was not constructed by chronology. It was not, yes. we know that. Even yeah. Muslims tell us that it was constructed by size. By size, yeah. So the smallest ones first, the largest, I'm sorry, the largest ones first, the smallest ones later. Right. If you're going to construct a, a book that supposedly is about God, which the earliest, the smallest, the smallest verses are all about God. There's very little there about Muhammad in right. the Meccan surahs. Okay. It's all about God up here, man down here, and how we must obey and submit to God. There's an awful lot in the Meccan surahs that we can accept. That really would sound like a book that okay. was written for okay. Okay. a as a revelation for the people of the, of the book. That's okay. why we can accept so much of the Meccan revelation. Okay. It's when you get to the larger, the longer material. Now, when you start realizing that you're going to have to start giving this man authority, you're going to have to make sure that this man is this prophet, whatever his name is, then you start writing a lot more about his life. Did you notice okay. that? Okay. Yeah. You start writing about his wives in Surah 33. You start yeah. writing about his conflicts mm -hmm. and all the talk difficult. Then you start getting into the made of the rules and regulation. And that's why the Medinan Surahs, which are much longer, are much more ingrained. Then they are trying to construct it. I would suggest that this has nothing to do with chronology. This has everything to do with trying to create and trying to make sure that there are rules and regulations for every area of life. That's why they are such, so much longer. That would make sense then that why they were put in that order. Now that's just me speaking. I'm not going to say other scholars may disagree with us. But what I find fascinating is now can you understand why there's so many contradictions in the Quran? Sure. Because if you're creating it and you're manipulating it and you're moving it around and you're getting it and you're borrowing it, and because of the fact that so many of the stories in the Quran are borrowed anyway, it's 25% of the Quran, we know right, exactly right, where yeah, those stories yeah, come yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. They are not Arab stories, they are not Nabataean stories. Most of them are Jewish apocryphal accounts and Byzantine Christian Syriac Gnostic writings. Now, if that is the case, you can understand they all come much later because that means they have to be borrowed, but they borrowed the wrong stories. If you're talking, then you get to the other part of the Quran, which is the poetry. 30% of the Quran is beautiful poetry. Almost every one of those strophes of poetry are from Christian hymns. 
written in the 5th and 6th century, written in Syriac, interposed into Arabic in the 7th or 8th or 9th century. So it's an amalgamation of many different stories, many different traditions, and also the most important is the later the Medina, because then there you, you use the Quran to then give authority to this prophet. This prophet who is named in 691. Right. So the name is there. Why is the name not in the Quran? Mm -hmm. There's no excuse for it. Unless they still have not decided in the Quran yet, they had not decided what they're going to do with this prophet. Them, and that's why it takes so long for them to write his traditions. Now you say, where did all these hadith come from? Look at the date. 870. That's 240 years later. Right. And where did the 600 Akbar come from? I would suggest it comes from many different traditions, and that's why Al Buhari was given the job to whittle them away and throw 98% out. Wouldn't it have been nice if he had kept those 98% so we could look yeah. at them today? Because yeah. then I would suggest we would know an awful lot more about that culture, about that time, and why they were thrown out. So you think the the hadith, uh, the hadith of uh, Abu uh, Sahih Abu Khari are about a prophet, and later his name is. is oh, by that time, by the time they do write his story in 833, it is Muhammad. That's no doubt. Everything about the Siddha is about him. Okay. But see, that's another hundred years after the Quran was already yes, put together. Yes, yes. See, the Quran didn't have that benefit. They, okay. So that's why, is it not, to me, it makes all the sense in the world that the Sira and the Hadith and the Tafsir are another 100 to 150 years later. Okay. But you can imagine, before they even got to that, there was a multiplicity of many different variations. And we're, we're seeing that as well. And that's why you have Al Buhari and Al Sahih Muslim don't agree with each other on many of their traditions. By the time you get to the 10th century, good old Al Tabari, one of the things we know about Al Tabari, he writes everybody's story. Yes, yes. He puts them all together, all these contradicting stories, and he assumes the reader is going to do the job yes, of assigning yes, yes. which is true and which is not true. Yes. That's why we love Al Dhabi, because he doesn't even care if they conflict. Yes, 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 yes. He's probably the most honest amongst them. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to ask any question, but I want to say something. First uh, is about the name of Allah. The name of Allah is not uh, sourced from any pagan god or some other place. The Arabic word is Elahun. Elahun means is the personality we worship him. And when we say Al, it's like the, it, uh, there's one book and we say the book, the special book. So when we use Alif Lam with Elahun, it means Al Elahun and it changes into Allah. So it means a special personality we worship to him and it is not belong to any other uh, source and it is very clearly uh, uh, Muslims believe that God has no wife. So there cannot be contradiction. So it okay, is let, me, uh, let me just respond to that real quickly. Tari, and for those who no, don't know, no, Tariq no. has been to every one of these meetings and we love him because he loves to sit there and he loves to try to confront me on this. So let me, let me answer that no, very quickly. No, I, I, what, I does, don't to, what does Allah mean in Arabic? What it, does it mean? The personality, the special personality the we worship God. Point. God. Now, you're putting personality on because you're trying the personality, to find God. God. Does he mean, have 99 names? Yes, yes, they, they, are, they are not. The uh, Do those names describe who he is? Uh, describe, uh, his, uh, Do those names uh, describe who he is? His attributes. Okay. In any of those 99 names, are any one of them Yahweh? Uh, no, I, I don't know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Stop and think that through. Are you all following what I'm doing no. here? Can you see if every prophet had one name for God that was used right through 3,400 years? For 3,400 years, there was all, I'm sorry, for 1,400 years, there was always one name for God that every prophet used. That was Yahweh. That's the name that would define which God we were talking about. That's the name that Moses needed to go down to Egypt so that the children of Israel know what God he represented. That's why Moses said, what is your name? He didn't want Allah, the God. That's not a name, that's a title. Can you imagine me being an ambassador coming to Hong Kong? I said this in the, earlier this morning, and I come to the authority here in uh, Hong Kong. I'm the ambassador for the United States, 
and um, I want to come and I want to introduce and give you my credentials as being the ambassador. And you, you as a politician, say, well, okay, um, so you're the ambassador, and who you represent? I, I'm re representing the president. Okay, and what's his name? Well, I don't know his name, but he's the president. <laughs> what kind of ambassador would I be if I don't even know my president's name? What kind of prophet is Muhammad if he doesn't even know his the name of God? The God is not a name. It is a title. No, I, so that's I, why we've been asking this. I've been asking for 35 years. You've got to do better than Allah, especially when you know that that name is a Nabataean really? name. It is a pre-Islamic name. It is a pagan name. And it is a polytheistic name. And that God, Allah, does have a wife. Now, don't say he doesn't have a wife. That's because you're just following what your Quran says. You're mimicking your Quran. But you've got to, Tari, you've got to start looking at this historically. Don't just tell me what you know. Because you you're just going to tell me what you've been taught. You are Listen to what we're saying. You are a historian, I am not a historian. I am so telling deal that, with that, that what is my belief yeah. that Allah is a personal name and other names are attributive names. Does anybody okay. in this room believe that Allah is a personal name? No, but we are Muslim believe. We Muslim believe. Well, I know you have we, to believe. We, we believe. So how we explain, you should uh, accept that how we believe. Listen, you I cannot believe that. You, you cannot force so. us to believe like this. Okay. Tariq, you still haven't answered me. On, on, Tariq, please listen me. You listen still haven't answered me. Why did Muhammad know God's personal name? The real personal name that you'll find 6,823 times in the Old Testament, the name that every prophet used, the name that Jesus used. And when he used it, the Jews took stones to stone him because he, a fear man, was claiming that name for himself. Why does that name not, then why is that name not found here? Smith, I, I cannot uh, understand all English. My English is yeah. uh, vague. But I want to say something what I can understand. Okay. And I don't need to Can debate. You answer that question? I don't, I don't need to debate. Okay, so I, I want to explain you question. because I am feeling that uh, yeah. they cannot be misguided. They should know how we Muslim believe. We believe that Allah has no wife. Allah is his personal name and other names are his attributes name. Okay, one thing. The second you say that Quran was not composed in a, in a, uh, in a chronicle order. Uh, it was uh, composed uh, by size. Quran was not uh, composed in a chronicle, yes. The second, Quran was not uh, composed by size. It is wrong. The first surah is very small, only seven verses. But the next surah is very long surah. Sorry, I'm going to jump on the rope. You listen to me. I don't want to debate. I don't want to debate. I'm going to jump on the rope when you brought it up. Have you looked at any of the earliest manuscripts? No, you haven't. I don't know you haven't. Is the Fatiha in any of those manuscripts? No, it isn't. It is not in the top copy. I'm sorry, it is in the top copy, but that's the latest of it. It's not in the Samarkand, it's not in the Tashkent in Uzbekistan, in Uzbekistan, it's not in the in the Husseini manuscript, it's not in the Maidan manuscript. This five of the six major manuscripts, the Fatiha, the one that you're talking about, is not even in those manuscripts. It is a later inclusion. So please on that one, I'll confront you on that. Okay. Now you were here on Wednesday, you should have known that. Okay, I I I'll check that. And but you cannot prove that every surah, the first surah is bigger, the second and third is going to smaller, to no. smaller, smaller. This by is not the, rule by of thumb. Side. It's rule of thumb. Uh, the, this uh, surah was uh, placed according to the revelation. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he in the throne that God tell me that this surah should be first and the second, third, and like this. The even the say. verses. Even the verses are also right. Okay. These are arranged by Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, tell, I'm going to ask one more question. Please, please. I'm going to throw right back at let you. Me, let me complete. Let I, me I'm complete. just going to talk about what you just said. Have you looked at any of the origin, the order of the surahs on all the earliest manuscripts? Do they follow that what you, you just you said? You are a historian. I am following the present uh, uh, Quran Karim. So I, I don't have studied what, what was the first uh, secretary and so Just so everybody now. knows this. So, uh, you, you have your study. Let me I will, just so everybody I will knows this, in all this. of the manuscripts that we have, they do not follow the same order of surahs. So this whole idea that Muhammad gave the reference to the surahs is completely false. I, I don't have study, so I cannot talk to you. Yeah. But I need to know this. So okay. Just, uh, okay. And the third one. You say that the Quran was not uh, compiled in the life of the Holy Prophet. Quran exists in the life of the Holy Prophet. By oral tradition, people memorize it in their heart. And when they recite this Quran in their prayers and in Ramadan, uh, the Holy Quran was uh, recited. So there was a, a sequence. How they recite this? They recite this is first, second, third, and so forth. And there was an arrangement by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Some people were appointed 
to write this revelation and they teach the other people and sometimes Holy Prophet himself asks the people, uh, I want to listen, you recite Holy Quran. So there was a tradition, every people, they recite the Holy Quran with a sequence. So it was present in their heart by which sequence and it was also present on different uh, okay, let's uh, things. Let's take that what you just said. How many of you believe that the Quran was memorized in accurately and completely correct like the Quran we have today? How many believe that memorization supports what he just said? How do you know they memorized it? What did they memorize? What manuscript did they memorize? Did they memorize the top copy? Did they memorize the Samarkand, which doesn't agree with the top copy? Which doesn't agree with the Ma'il? Which doesn't agree with the Husseini? Which doesn't agree with the Petropolis? Which doesn't agree with the Sana? I've given you six major manuscripts. All of them are completely different. So what did they memorize? Secondly, where do you get your story that Muhammad made them memorize it and Muhammad was there? Where does that story come from? It comes from Al-Buhari. When did he write that? In 870. So everything you're going to tell me, everything you're going to re recite like you do every night, comes from 240 years later. How is it you can even trust that? Since we don't even know of a person named Muhammad who did any of this, since we have no reference. And if you're gonna say it doesn't matter that it wasn't written down, then what are you gonna do with your own reference in Hadith number, uh, uh, chapter six, Hadith number 509 and 510, which tells all of us that it was written down. And it was written down at the time of Abu Bakr, two years after Muhammad. What happened to that recension? Where is that codex? It was then rewritten again during the time of Uthman. Not memorized, written down. And nine copies were made. Where are those nine copies? Brother, you have told your dear lecture. If you want to... I'm asking these questions of no, you. No, no. I have told you my English is not uh, very good. If your language is English, my language is not English. So I cannot follow you completely. But what I understand from your lecture, I want to explain that there is a opportunity they can understand and say, listen, a Muslim, how they believe, okay? I, 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 I don't need Muslims believe. I don't need Do you all know what Muslims believe? Is there anybody here who doesn't know what Muslims believe? Everything Tariq is going to tell us mm -hmm. is from the 9th and 10th century. This is the classic account that you hear ad nauseum, but you haven't dealt with what we're doing today. Tariq, you need to stick to the material we're talking about. Where is you, you, this you give me this material. Record? You give me this material. I'll give you my. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. And what you need to do, Tariq, is you need to go home, like you did on Wednesday. I, I, I study. I, I like. I like study. Okay. You are a historian, and I will come here. All these three days I came, and my some fellow also uh, come with me. But I tell you, do you are saying that Quran was written in the time of the Abu Bakr, but it was already present. I have told you oral tradition. I memorized. People are satisfied that there is no problem. So when they feel that uh, 500 Hufas, though they memorized the Holy Quran, they martyred in a uh, war, so they feel that we should uh, compose it in a one book. So they composed it. And in the time of the Abu Bakr. Listen, Tariq, everything you're saying we already know. This is nothing yes. new. What we're asking but, but is. But your conclusion is different. Your conclusion is different. So I want to tell you. No, you have, to, you have to give them lecture. I, I, now it's your turn to lecture. Need, need that I can explain. <laughs> you want to okay. listen to this for an hour and a half? I, I, I want to. I want okay, to. Cut it, cut it. Listen, wrap it up real quickly and then let this respond. Because I know you do this every time. You like to then give your own account. And that's nice. God bless you. Doesn't he have passion? Isn't it great that he loves to tell us exactly what he believes? But has he listened to anything I said today? Is he even dealing with this material? Can you see, it's going to be a waste of time for us, Tariq, just for you to tell us what you like us to hear. I know you love to talk. As you like, as you like, if you don't want well, to know how I, I, I want okay, to okay. respond to this very quickly, and I okay. think well, that'll be in for today. Okay. When you look and hear these kind of responses, and this is what you're going to get, do you notice he has not dealt with the material today? He hasn't even dealt with the material from Wednesday night. I don't think, Tariq, you have listened to anything we said Wednesday night, or anything we've said today. And for those Muslims who are listening, this is not the way to defend your prophet. And this is not the way to defend your Quran. You Muslims have need to get a better defense than this. If all you're gonna do is tell us what you already know, without dealing with the fact that this book that you always claim was memorized or was given to a man by Muhammad and given to the people at that time, Show me one copy. Be, don't just say he gave it. Don't just say they memorized it. Prove it. 
If you're going to say that this was then written down at the time of Abu Bakr and then rewritten again at the time of Uthman in 652 and nine copies were made, then give us one copy. That's all we're asking. If you're going to tell me that Islam somehow grew out of the desert in a period of 22 years, a sophisticated religion like we have today, in a nomadic environment with no urban structures, with all the rules and regulations, look at Sharia law. They make no sense in a nomadic environment in the middle of the desert. They make much more sense in a much more urban environment that would have existed in the ninth century. That's why is it not interesting that all of Islamic law, from Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, and Hanafi, are ninth century writers. These are not seventh century writers. Now, Muslims need to be careful about just keep on telling us the same narrative. Deal with the historical problems. First of all, let me just run through the art. The first problem you have, Muslims, is that if God is going to give us a revelation and create a whole new religion that is different than what is already God, why in the world did he not give us a revelation that agreed with the previous revelations? Number one. Number two, if God suddenly, seven, 600 years later, is going to give a new revelation in a completely new language, why in the world did he not use a language that could have accommodated it? The Arabic in the time of the 7th century didn't have any diacritical marks, had no vowelization. How could it even accommodate the text that we're looking at? Number three, if God was going to give us a brand new revelation and start a whole new religion, why in the world did he choose a man who could not read or write? Number four, if that man could not read or write, why did he not, in the next 22 years, did he not learn to read or write? If this is the most important thing he was supposed to be given for the rest of the world. Number five, why is it that when Islam finally supposedly was created, why was it created, according to you, in the middle of the desert which had no city named Mecca? And for a hundred years that city didn't exist. Historically, you cannot get away with that. More than that, why is it the mosques that we've looked at, 65 of them, and we've been there physically, we've been there personally, the mosque is facing Petra. You've got the wrong city. You've got to deal with this, buddy. Don't just tell me the story again. Why haven't you dealt with the problem of Mecca? Why have you not dealt with the problem of the Qibla? And why is it Muslims are just blanking out over and over again and just telling me the same narrative? You've got to tell me why mosque is facing Petra, 600 miles too far north. You've got to tell me why there is no Mecca. That's 600 miles too far south. And why is it if this man, Muhammad, was born in Mecca, grew up in Mecca, how could he have been born and grew up in a city that didn't even exist? for another hundred years after him. More than that, if you are the ones that are telling me that Abraham was in Mecca, how is it that Abraham could have, who lived in 1900 BC, lived in a city that didn't exist, and what is he doing 600 miles too far south? Now can you understand why we're asking these questions? And everything I've asked today, except for the last part and the very first part, have nothing to do with me being a Christian. This is neutral as you can get. And for those who are watching this up on YouTube, any one of you can ask this question. It's already been asked of Christianity. It's already been asked about our Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we make a historical claim, whether it's by Abraham living in 1900 BC, we can back up that claim because we have documents to support who Abraham was, where he lived, the customs that he, that he lived by. We have the Nuzi tablets, we have the Mara tablets, we have the Ebla tablets, all supporting we got the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. And these all predate the Bible by a good 1400 years. When you look and you ask whether Moses could have done what he did, we do not only know that who he could have done what he did, we, gave, we have him in the right place. And what's more, in every case, one of the things I love about living in London for 25 years, when you come to London, come to the British Museum, God bless the British, they stole everything, brought it to one building so we can look at it. And when you look at that British Museum, it supports First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles, it supports the book of Jeremiah, the book of Isaiah, the book of Daniel, it even supports much of the book of Genesis. We have got the right men at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. And that's why we have a three hour tour just looking at all the artifacts. None of those artifacts have anything to do with Christianity or Judaism. It's all about the people who were impacted by just Christianity and Judaism. It is all extra biblical material, proving that the Bible uniquely in the world is the only book that fits history. And that's why when Muslims always come up to me and they say they don't like my Old Testament, because you have terrible things that the prophet do. How can a prophet do these terrible things? I shake their hands. Because we have not sanitized the text. Yes, the great men of God did terrible things. 
Every other archaic historical book sanitizes it all. Even the Quran does. So when you get the prophet in the Quran, he is the best man, he is the best lover, he is the best husband, he is the best conqueror, and everything he is superlative, that's exactly what people do to men of their men of their history. The Bible is unique. It doesn't sanitize a thing. David had terrible sins. Every man of God had terrible sins. We leave it there. And the Bible is the only piece of literature that leaves the sins there. Look at the New Testament. Look at the disciples who ran away from Jesus Christ when he was arrested. Look at Peter who denied Christ three times. Look at Paul. No one got along with Paul. Why did we not sanitize the text? Because we left the history there. Because God works with men who are sinful. Weak men like you and me. My God allows even sinful men to be part of his story. And the story I see in the Bible is the story of God taking weak plague pots, even prostitutes, and making them the ancestors for Jesus Christ. That's the kind of God we have, and that's the kind of book we have. Historically speaking, this has been attacked historically. In every case, history has shown that this book stands above any other book in history. You cannot find anything wrong with it. And I'll end with a quote by Nelson Gluck. Dr. Nelson Gluck said, There is not one artifact, not one tablet, not one mural, not one obelisk, not one stella anywhere in the world that controverts a properly understood biblical statement. We pretty well not, not only destroyed the Quran on Wednesday, we destroyed also Muhammad and the whole emergence of Islam today by looking at all this material. This is just the beginning. Folks, come on back to this book and come back to the man behind this book. Because this book does stand the test. And we do not claim, we do not yell at people when they criticize it. We don't call them hate mongers like you did yes on Thursday. We don't we don't need to say that. You can criticize this book anytime you want. You can criticize Jesus anytime you want. We don't even have a word called Christianophobia. That doesn't even exist. We don't need it because Jesus, under criticism, stands up to every criticism. The Bible when criticizes, stands up to every criticism. What a man, what a book. I bring you home. God bless you, it's been great to have these last two hours with you. Thanks, Tati, for coming, you're such a blessing. <laughs>